In this video, I'm going to go over two items. Um, the first item is going over the method of doing outlier analysis. In this case, it's going to be outlier analysis by the IQR method. I know that people could do outlier analysis by z-scores, but actually it's more common to do it by IQR method. So that's what I want to present, and that's what I would expect to be in the homework problems that are being turned in for this course. Um, we have some data, home prices. And you can see that they're in thousands of dollars. Um, so we have homes that are really, really cheap, 48800 and homes that are really, really expensive in this data set. And it's not tons of data, um, just enough to have a good example to walk you through. Um, so the home prices here are in column A. The first question says, using the home prices in the column A data, give the five number summary, and are there any outliers? And in this case, being very specific that we're going to use IQR method, which is called inner quartile range uh, method. And then part B says complete a box plot. So for part A, I need to do the five number summary. Now the five number summary is kind of made up of five numbers. The first number is the minimum. We have Q1, which means uh, quartile, first quartile. 25% of the data is below that value. We have the median, which is also called Q2. This is the second quartile. That means 50% of the data is below this value also means 50% of the data is above that value. So median is a very important measure of center. And then we have the third quartile, and then we have the maximum data value. The five number summary is entails. So whenever they say five number summary inside statistics, it's a measure, these are measures of location actually. So to do the minimum, a couple different ways. We could use a quartile function, but I actually like using the minimum function because it'll remind you that you can do that on anything. If you're looking at five quiz scores and you want to know what the minimum is, you could use this function to tell you what it is. And we're going to use cell references here. So if I say equals minimum, which is just min, and you can see here, since I min, it says here's four functions it knows I might want. I actually want min. And then do a and it'll say, what are the numbers? Now, I could type each number in individually, but that would take a long time. I want to do cell references instead. So here I'm going to use my cursor to highlight the first number. And then by holding down the cursor, I can then tell it where to end. So actually, I want it to find the minimum data value between A2 and A15, which is where all my home prices are at. And then I'm going to end with a parentheses, and it says, hey, the lowest number is 48.8, which is exactly what we saw when we were reviewing the data. I can also then do the same type of thing for the maximum, equal max. And once again, instead of typing in numbers, I'm going to hold down the cursor, which you can see up here, and give it the cell range. Time it says cell range inside a formula. It's talking about where's the beginning cell and the ending cell of the data you want Excel to look at. And then the function tells it what to do. So it knows to look at A2 through A15 and give me the maximum value. And actually, the maximum value is pretty big, 325. So it's $2.3 million, $2.325,000 for a house. Um, this is just data that we got from our textbook. So now that I have those, I need the rest of the five number summary, which is the quartiles. And here you're going to find it's very easy to use the quartile function. And you can see that there's different options. And funny enough, Excel 2010, which is what I'm using, does retain a lot of the Excel 2007's uh, data uh, functions that it had. So originally, it was just called quartile. And so if you have Excel 2007, that's the function you want to use. But if you have 2010, you have these two other functions. You have functions that work off of percents, exclusive and inclusive. I'm just going to use the quartile function because it's actually the one at work. So I open a print and it says, okay, where's the data and what quartile do you want? Well, we know that we're going to use a cell reference for the data. And the quartile one is the first quartile. So if it was zero, it would give me, as you can tell you right here, zero would give you the minimum value. So I could use that actual function for the minimum. I just wanted to show you that there's other ways because uh, you may often want to find the minimum among data values or the maximum among data values. And you may not remember quartile. Here I want the first quartile. And you can see there that the first quartile among all that data, in other words, 25% of the values are below 183.5.
Now you can see I didn't do any hard references. Now the way to do hard references is when you don't want, if you're going to copy down a formula and you don't want the A2 through A15 to move down with you, then you're going to have to get dollar signs on it to hard uh, lock them in. And to do that, you can highlight any of the references, in this case A2, and hit F4, and it'll say, hey, I'm going to lock that in, highlight A5, A15, F4, and now it's locked it in. So it doesn't matter where I copy reference to, you're going to see that it's not going to change the cells. If I had not locked them, when I copied down the formula, move it from A2 to A3 for every one I move down. So now that the first quartile is done and locked in, you can see that I can actually copy this down. Now, initially when I copy it down, it's going to look exactly the same. It doesn't know to change the one to a two, but I'm going to go ahead now and edit formula for a median. The median is the second quartile. So though I do want the data to go from A2 to A15, I actually need to have a two so that it knows I'm looking for the median value. And then on the third quartile, I still want it locked still an A2 to A15, but I need it for the third quartile. And you can see here, this is the five number summary. And you can see we're not just typing in answers. We're not doing this on a calculator and just figuring out the answers and throwing them in Excel. We're using Excel. It's very important that you know how to use Excel to get the answers and that any uh, instructor, including myself, who's clicking on your cells can see your work. That's your work. I don't have to write a whole bunch of explanation over here on the right hand side of exactly what I did, because all a professor is going to do and a instructor is going to do is they're going to click on the cell and they're going to see your cell references, your formulas. What did you do? How did you arrive at it? How did you use Excel to get to those answers? So now the question said, not just to give the five number summary, but they also said, are there any outliers? And we're going to use the IQR method. So let's just review the IQR method. The IQR method comes up with fences. The minimum fence is based off of the uh, Q1. And it's going to subtract away 1.6 times the IQR, which we haven't calculated yet. We will be able to do so uh, now that we have the five number summary. Maximum fence is at Q3. Remember, 50% of the data is going to be between Q1 and Q3. We're looking for outliers that are below Q1, in fact, exactly one, minus 1 1.5 times IQR below. And if it is, it's going to be considered an outlier. And then on the max side, we have to start at Q3 and add 1.5 times the IQR. And that's going to indeed give us any data values that are beyond that fence. We know they are actual outliers. So this is not subjective. It's actually done by calculation. Those I'm just writing down so you can see the formulas that we'll be doing. But obviously, I need to actually do the work. First thing I better find is the IQR. So let's write over here the IQR for this problem. And you know the IQR is going to be three minus Q1. Next to the cell, I have it labeled what I'm calculating, but next to it, I'm putting equals. I'm going to take the Q3. I'm going to subtract away Q1. You can see right up here in the formula that I'm doing cell references. I don't need to actually take and type the values, though it's okay to do so, but it's nice to do cell references. That way, if you find an error somewhere early on when you fix that, everything then fixes with it versus all being hard-coded with your actual numbers, and then you'd have to remember all the places to fix. See the IQR here is 360. Now it's easy to figure out my minimum fence and my maximum fence. I have everything I need. And I'm going to use cell references again, following the formula here, but actually using cell references to replace what are inside the formula. So the minimum fence, I'm going to put in right to the right of that, an equal sign. I know I have to start at Q1, which happens to be a cell E7 here. I'm going to subtract away one and a half times the IQR which we in H7. And I'm going to hard code the H7 because I don't want that to move when I go to copy my formulas around. See that the minimum fence is at negative 359.8. Well, we don't have any, no such thing as a negative home price, so I know I have no outliers that are actually on the minimum side. But I still have to calculate the maximum fence. The maximum fence starts at Q3. But at Q1, that's not correct. Maximum starts at Q3. I'm going to add 1.5 times the IQR. And I'll just hard code it so that in case anything gets copied around, you know that that's where the IQR is sitting. And you can see the maximum fence at 108, uh, 1089.063. So it looks like I'm going to have some outliers. 
Now, you may say to yourself, well, it's hard to see in here where the outliers are at, and that's correct. So a lot of times, it's really nice to sort your data. So though I know where the fences are, I'm still not comfortable answering the question of what the outliers are. So let me go ahead and highlight the data itself. And under data, there's a sort feature. And it's a nice feature. If you hit sort, you can say, what are you going to sort by? I'm sorting by home price and smallest to largest is the easiest. And you can see that since everything is still referencing A2 to A15, and that's where my data is, sorting it will not change anything, but it makes it easy to answer the question. What are the outliers? Let me put outliers are. And then I have to state what the data values are. I can't just say there's one outlier or two outliers. Whenever you're stating outliers, always state the actual values that are indeed outliers. And by this method, anything above 1089, which looks like it's 2325, oh, the only outliers. One in this data set, and it happens to be this. And as much as we think 48.8 subjectively is very low compared to the data, by calculation, it's not actually an outlier. Now, just so you know, for your reference, this outlier method is based off of what they call mild outliers. There's also one for extremes that are based off of three times IQR, but we're really not going to go into that method. We're just talking about outlier analysis in general and just sticking with this uh, calculation. But if you are interested in out, out, extreme outliers, which are at three times IQR, um, you can, I'm sure you can find some other videos that are on that. So that answers question of part A. So I just want to highlight what I did here. Everyone knows where my work is, part A. I'll even put a little note here, part A. Very important to label your answers so that someone has a clue where the answers are. Um, sometimes people will boxes around them. That works great as well. Got to remember, someone's looking at a lot of spreadsheets. The easier you make it and label your answers and label your work, the better off you are. So now we'll go to part B. Part B says create a box plot. Now I'm just reminding you that you should always, whenever doing any kind of graph or table, always have a title. Graphs without titles are not very meaningful to your audience. Remember, they don't really know what you're talking about, and it's only by looking at the title of the graph, whether it's a box plot, a bar chart, a pie chart, etc., do they have any idea of what is the data that this is supposed to graphically represent. Even if you're doing a frequency distribution, you should always show titles. So that's just a quick reminder to you. Now, for doing a box plot, it's not very easy in Excel. So what I had done for you is I had given you a box plot template. And if you open that file that's already been given to you, you will see here that somebody had already put data in and showed how it would do a box plot. If the data is here from M4 onward, it will then do the calculations for you of the box plot. And to do that, it needs to do the five number summary, but it's done by whiskers and hinges. Uh, I would call them a box, actually. This is the lower end of the box. This is the upper end of the box. So let's just review it so it makes sense to you. Here's the data, not the one we're going to do, but data that's already been put in. You can see the data goes all the way down. There's 42 pieces of data. And it went ahead and did calculations. And if you look inside the cells, you're not supposed to change these. But if you look inside, you can see they're doing a minimum and a quartile and a median and a quartile and a maximum. Remember, Q2 is the same thing as a median. And once it has those five, then it goes ahead, the computer already, already does it for you, creates the box plot. It just doesn't put a type title in, and that's something we'll have to add. So how would we use this for our data? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to delete out the data that's there. So I'm going to highlight all the data and hit the it's no longer there, which, of course, means right now I can't do anything for us. But we have data. We have our home prices. All I have to do is convert and get the data from the home prices, which we have in our Excel, and do a copy and copy that over into the template. And I'll then start a paste at M4, because that's where the data has to start. So now I'll do a paste option. And you can say the data is all there. And the moment the data is there, then this template will go ahead and calculate what it needs to create this box plot right here. Now remember, here's how the box plot set up. The middle line is the median. And you can see the median is very close to the Q1. Q1 is the left side of the box. Q3 is the right side of the box. We know that 50% of the data is between these two values, which is not so easy to see on here. Um, you have to do a little bit of work, but it looks like it's right above 200. And you can see over here, 183.5, all the way up to um, 
545. So 50% of the home prices are between those two values. The median is actually closer to the Q1, and that's sitting at about 215.9. And then it's called a box and whisker plot a lot, and that's what these are called. They're called whiskers. Whiskers go out to the maximum value, and they go out to the minimum value. The maximum value is at 995.9. Oh, I'm sorry. Whiskers go out to the maximum value, which is sitting at uh, 2325. But since it's an outlier, this program is smart enough to call that an outlier and have the maximum only go out to the values that are not outliers. So the maximum that's not an outlier is 995, 995.9. So what BoxBots typically will do with any kind of software and whoever set up this template, which I got off the Internet, um, they did the same thing. They put in just little circles for those outliers. So though you can't really do this for outlier analysis because if it had three circles here, you'd have no idea what data values they're done. You want to do the outlier analysis the way I showed you earlier in this video. The nice thing about this feature is it does confirm we do have an outlier on the right hand side. So now that I have the box plot, I have to change and get a title in here. It's very important you have a title and not leave it generic. And of course, this is home prices. That's in thousands of dollars. So let's make a change. You just click inside, delete out what's there, type in your title. Now the key question I often get is how do I get this box plot into my Excel? So I'm going to show you. If you click on the outside of the box plot that's now created, the one you want, and you do a right click, you can do a copy. Then you go to the Excel file that you want. If you remember correctly, this was our Excel file. I'm going to move down below Part B because I want to have it labeled. It belongs in Part B. And then I can do a paste. And in this case, I'm going to do a paste special. And the reason I want to do a paste special, if you do it as a picture, you don't have to worry about anything changing. You don't have to worry about as data gets changed in the template, it starts changing what you put in this program. You're taking a picture as it is as a finished product. So I'm going to take picture. It doesn't matter if you do JPEG or otherwise. And then it pastes it in. And you can see now this is hard coded. This is the answer to the question. This is a title on it. It has the box fly I want. If I have several sets of data, uh, say women's and men's times, and I have to do box plots. I had to do one of each. So now would be the time to go back, change out the data to the other gender's times, put it in, and then create your second box plot. So you end up with two box plots here. Now, if I was comparing data and I wanted to know which one had more variation, I would look at the size of the IQR. The size of the IQR will tell you where 50% of the data is. And the larger that is, the more variation there is in a data set. Here, we don't happen to be comparing it to another data set, so I don't have an answer to the question because I only have one data set. But if indeed you're comparing two data sets, for example, men's times and women's time, and you want to know which one has more variation, you look and see which one has the bigger box. And you can typically tell that if they're not on the same scale by looking at the IQR, the size of the IQR itself, which you should have calculated somewhere in the problem. And that would, and then you want to make sure you answer that question. So. Make sure when you're doing your homework so that you're checking through all the questions that asked within each part and that you made sure you've answered each question. So this video then did walk you through the five number summary, showing the work, all the formulas, shows you how to do an outlier analysis based off an IQR method, 1.5 IQR method, and how to actually label your answer. Your answer is not one outlier. You actually have to state each and every value that's an outlier commas in between. We happen to only have one here. And then when they ask you ask, do a box plot, though there's many ways on the internet to do a box plot, I found this template was the easiest way. If you clear out the data that's here, copy and paste in the data you want, it'll create it automatically. Just make sure you don't mess with any of the formulas already hard-coded there. You're interested in the finished product over here of the box plot. Once you have a title on it, you're going to copy it over as a picture into the final file you want it in. And if you have several box plots to do, you obviously have to do that several times with different data sets. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Have a great day.